Welcome, everybody, um, and, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it, it's great to uh, have those of you who have been part of these conversations over the, the many months that SRQ Strong has been hosting them, and uh, welcome new people who are joining us for the first time um, for this evening's conversation, uh, which is about parents who have the power to change the world. It's, it's really an impactful topic, and I think a very apt uh, title for what you'll be hearing this evening. So my name is Giselle Solper, and um, I'm one of the founding members of, of Sarasota Strong, and I'm kind of the hostess of, of the evening. Um, and before I introduce our moderator, who will then introduce our panelists and we get going, um, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, Annalise has put up the description of, of Sarasota Strong on the screen so you all know uh, a little bit about who we are. And we started several years ago. And we are a continually growing group um, of Sarasota County individuals, neighborhoods, um, and, and people from all walks of life who are interested in and committed to promoting community-wide awareness about trauma and its impact. And we do this through a variety of services and programs. We have um, healing programs, education, action, um, advocacy action campaigns, and through leadership in making our community, our Sarasota community, about aware about the impact of trauma. And I hope that you, uh, if you're joining us for the first time, that by the end of the evening, you're going to be inspired by what you hear and want to learn more about Sarasota Strong um, and become involved. And you'll see that our website address is right here on the slide and our email if you'd like more information or like to learn more about our many activities. So before I introduce the moderator, I just wanted to mention a little bit about um, how I got involved. And because I think the story, the personal story is, is so important to hear. And you'll be hearing that throughout this evening, why people are involved, why people are, um, have been so affected by trauma and, and its, its impact. So um, I got involved because like many people, I experienced trauma in my life and um, in the life of my entire family when my daughter became ill at the age of 12 and was diagnosed with a serious mental illness. And life changed on a dime. And that was 20 years ago. So I'm 20 years later and able to look and look back um, at what I've been through and, and where I'm, I'm going. And it's, it's really, um, it's, it's interesting that here I am kind of the, uh, the hostess of, of this particular session because when my daughter became ill, it was other parents who got me through it. it wasn't the professionals, although they were very important, I'm not saying they weren't, but it was other parents who really gave me the kind of information that I needed day in and day out and know where to go and who to turn to. And not only information, they gave me strength. They, you know, they gave me strength that I'm not alone and that I'm gonna be able to get through this. And above all, they gave me hope that there was light at the end of what was a very dark tunnel at the time that didn't seem that it would ever end but they gave me hope that it would. And so it's, it's really, um, you know, life operates in funny ways. So it probably is not unusual that here I am and tonight's conversation is really about parents who have the power to change because I know I lived through it and know that we do. And I became one of those parents. Um, and tonight you're gonna hear about other parents who have, who have done that. So before I introduce our moderator, um, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if I may ask you to please keep um, your mics on mute. That's really important. And we're going to have a question and answer period at the end of the panelists um, when everybody has a chance to, to talk about and tell their stories. 
Um, and, and in the meanwhile, though, if you really have a question or something strikes you at the moment, uh, or you have a comment, please feel free to put it in the chat. And then at the end, when we go back and we do our question and answer, we'll go back and, and get to every single question, I promise, and every comment that everybody puts in. So let me introduce the real moderator. I'm the hostess, the real moderator, who uh, is going to be hosting the rest of this, this evening. Uh, it's Chelsea Arnold. Chelsea is a very active member of SRQ Strong um, and is the program coordinator for the first 1,000 days. Many of you may have heard of this project. It's really one of the most important system transformation projects um, it, I think that Sarasota has undertaken maybe ever. And um, it, it, the, the initiative is made up of over 75 community partners uh, who are working to improve the coordination of services and to increase access to care for pregnant mothers and for families of young children in our community to make sure that they have the resources and the tools that they need to thrive in those early years and those early days. So without further ado, let me introduce Chelsea and um, who will take you through the rest of the, to the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giselle. And it really is, it comes from full circle listening to you talk about your own experiences. And I think it's so lovely that you're the one that's introducing this topic tonight. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to share three incredible women with you this evening. Tonight, we will not only explore how parents have the power to shape their child's life, but also our community. By raising kind, compassionate, and resilient children, we can ensure that all families have the tools to help their children reach their full potential. We can really ignite a movement within our own neighborhoods, within the community, and then even the world. I would really like to quote the late Marjorie Baransic because she so eloquently spoke about how we can't change the world, but we can change little pieces of it and have a ripple effect. This initiative was spearheaded by the Charles and Marjorie Baransic Foundation, and we are truly starting to have that ripple effect within our community. Tonight, we will share two powerful stories of personal resilience from parents in our community and the importance of the parent-child bond. And then last, I will share with you some ways that you can get involved in our movement. I would first like to introduce you to Blake Nethery. Blake is a mother of a little toddler girl, and she is expecting her second any day now. I think her due date is within the next couple of days. So we are very thrilled that she has not gone into labor yet. And um, Blake is really gonna share with you her own personal story of resilience. Who were the people that helped her overcome it? What being a parent means to her and why she wants to be involved in the, in the initiative and anything moving forward to help young families in our community. Blake, I'm gonna toss it over to you and we appreciate you being here and hope you're feeling well. Hi, how are you guys? Can you guys hear me okay with the air conditioning in the background on my back porch? Okay. <laughs> You're good. All right. So um, I first found out about the first thousand days um, through someone heard me speak a couple years ago. I was a part of drug court and I gave a speech at Kaiser College and someone heard me speak and they kind of uh, was like, I think you'd be great for this. And I was like, well, what's it about? And they let me know what it was about. And here I am. So I'm kind of going to start because I know we're on a schedule here. Um, from a young age, I was raised by a single mom. Um, I had alcoholic dad and I had to go to my, uh, my grandma's and my dad's every weekend. And it was very abusive out there. A lot of alcoholics. Um, I witnessed physical abuse. I was sexually molested at a young age. Um, Fast forward, I was started having sex 12, 17, had an abortion, and I experienced a little bit of uh, drugs and how to numb some pain. Um, so I became a drug addict. Um, I was a drug addict for 12 years. Um, 
but a lot of this came from going through a lot of stuff from a very young age as a child, teenager, not being able to show emotions or feelings or had to push all that down because, you know, you didn't cry. Um, you know, you had to suck up your emotions back then. And so I was a drug addict and I learned how to numb pain from 17 years old to 28 years old. Um, and really, I have a cold right now, you guys, sorry. <laughs> and I'm due with a baby in like five days and I'm just, woo. So um, through all that, through drug addiction, um, I was in jail a lot. Um, I was a prostitute. Um, I'd get sober. I tried to, to move out of state, to relocate, to try to get my life together. Um, nothing ever seemed to work for me. I was in the rooms of like Narcotics Anonymous. Um, I would leave. I experienced a lot of trauma. I found my dad dead on my kitchen floor when I was 22 years old um, to an overdose. Um, I've also overdosed in my life and been brought back by uh, Mansi County uh, paramedics before. And I went to jail many times, and I guess I'm something you could, I was a, I was alive walking around in the body, but my spirit was literally dead. I did not want to live anymore. I had been through so much trauma in my life. I didn't even know how to overcome anything, you know, and anytime I'd experience any pain, I would want to take away the pain. And the only way I knew how to take away the pain was to have a drink to do drugs um, because growing up, I didn't learn how to communicate about anything. It was all kind of keep things inside and you couldn't trust a lot of people. So this last time around, I was 28 years old and uh, I got in, ooh, sorry here. I got in some criminal trouble and I went to jail. And I was someone who knew my spirit was dead. I didn't want to live. That was not, living was not an option for me. That's something I didn't want to do. I didn't want to face everyday life at all. Something happened in there. I was, first, I had a, something called the Vivitrol shot, which was a shot, which was a court ordered shot where I got it in the, for once a month. And I also had a lot of therapy, which I had been in therapy my whole life since I was like two or three years old because my mom was a young parent who didn't know how to deal with her out of control two-year-old that didn't want to listen. And that's kind of where it all started from trauma of a young age. So I was in drug court and I learned how to overcome a lot of things. I got very involved in the program as Narcotics Anonymous. Um, I was very involved with drug court. Um, there was a counselor in there. Her name was... I think I can use her name. Her name was Amanda. I'll just say that. And she is still today a really good friend of mine. I talked to her anytime I'm going through things. I learned that when you're going through things, you have to pick up the phone and start, you have to talk to someone. You have to get those things out, you know, whether it be a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just need to vent, get the words out, not keep the emotions in. And I didn't know how to do that. So I learned how to do that when I was 28 years old and she helped me through it. And it was a really big, uh, it was huge for me because I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to open up to women. I didn't know how to build healthy relationships. I um, didn't know anything about that. Um, a year later after that, I got pregnant with my daughter and kind of today where I'm at with my whole thing is that uh, generational curses. And it's really, it's a huge thing because, you know, I was raised a certain way. My mother was raised a certain way. Her parents were raised a certain way. That trauma continued in my life for all those years. And until I became aware of the trauma through the therapy and all the therapy I had, I didn't know how to fix it or correct it. I didn't know how to make sure I didn't make the mistake that my mom did the best she could her parents did the best she could today though I have the option in my life to kind of stand up and say hey this is not happening We're, I'm doing this a different way um it feels good it's hard 
a lot of days, but um, I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, the first thousand days is first three years. It's serious, you know, because those first three years of your child's life, they might not remember, but the body remembers. So it's like, uh, it can, sh it, it did a lot to me. And, you know, and today I'm just so grateful to be a sober mom have a two-year-old, a little handful daughter. And I'm also going through any kind of struggles like a mother would of, uh, she is, a uh, she's very strong willed. <laughs> I guess that's the easiest way to put it, but you know what? I don't try to change her. I, today I, I let her be who she is and you know what? It's hard to be the parent of that little girl, but she's going to do amazing things. Um, I just have to get through parenting her. <laughs> But um, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this program and I've overcame so much trauma and I know it's so hard to overcome trauma, but with the right support system and the right people in your life, it's possible to overcome anything. And it's still one day at a time and using my resources in the community, you know? And I don't know, that's it, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Blake. We really appreciate it. And um, what a beautiful sentiment. You know, you're really trying to change things for your daughter and your next little one. I can't remember if it's a boy or a girl that you're pregnant with. It's another little girl. Okay. So yeah. your two little girls, we really appreciate you, you sharing with us and we really value having you as a part of the initiative. It's really powerful to have people who have had lived experience really driving the, you know, driving the process forward. So thank you so much. And thank you for being here when your due date is just around the corner. Um, and I am going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Carla Johans, and she is the clinical director for 40 Carats. 40 Carats has been very active with First 1000 Days, uh, the initiative. You may have seen a beautiful mural on the outside of their organization. That is to raise awareness about the initiative. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Carla, and she is going to tell you a little bit about the impacts of trauma on early childhood and the importance of that uh, adult relationship in a child's life. And I'll kick it over to you, Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. And Blake, thank you for sharing your story. Beautiful, beautifully said. Um, I'm going to take a second just to share my screen. Can everybody see it okay? All right, so parents have the power to change the world. That's a big statement, but I happen to think that it is valid and a true one. Um, just so that, um, just so there's no misconception of parenting, I'm gonna use the term parent throughout this presentation, but it does not refer to only biological parents. It is those individuals who are responsible for the caregiving of a child. It could be a grandparent, a foster parent, an aunt, an uncle, a legal guardian. We're gonna use the word parent to encompass all of them. And a lot of the information that I am going to share today is specific to very young children um, and reflective of those first 1000 days of a child's life because we know they have a great impact. So let's start with a little science. 90% of a child's brain is developed by age five. It's a big statement. We know that the development continues until 25 or 26, but age five, 90% of them making sense of their world happens by then. More than a million new neural connections happen per second. So we look at the screen and we see the picture of the newborn brain and the neural connections at six months and then at two years. So at two years, they are taking it all in. They're trying to make sense of the world around them, but also they're trying to find their place within that world. It's happening at more than a million new neural connections per second. So if we're talking about parents, how do parents participate in these neural connections? What do they do to make sense, to help the child make sense of the world around them? Well, Harvard calls this serve and return, and they are going to explain it a lot better than I can, so I am going to play a short video for us all.
The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions, and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before, ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage and serve in return interaction beginning in infancy builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. So that's how parents are getting involved. They are communicating with their babies at a very early age. They're forming that attachment, that bond. I'm gonna say this now, I'm gonna repeat it a few times throughout this presentation. It is the first relationship of a child, that with their caregiver and themselves. And we want it to be as healthy as possible. So we know that serve and return interactions shape that brain architecture. And we know those babbles, those gestures, those cries, and an adult responding appropriately with eye contact, words, or a hug. Those neural connections that we saw the picture of, they're strengthening. They're going, they're going nuts. They're a million a second. Um, they're developing the communication and social skills that they need to form other healthy relationships. And when caregivers are sensitive and responsive to that young child's signal and needs, they provide that environment rich and serve in serve and return experiences. But more than that, they are providing that safe environment, that safe, secure home base that children need. So what happens when serve and return is disrupted? I'm gonna show you another video. Um, and it speaks for itself. I'm just gonna play it. Oops. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like, yeah. oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. 
It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Babies this young. So what the doctor said is true, and they replicated this experiment many times. Outcomes have been consistent across the board. In fact, they found that when they repeated the experiment with a child on more than one occasion, the baby actually tried less and less to engage the parent and quickly disconnected. So the good news is that this rupture in their relationship, that moment where the baby was trying to get the parents attention, the mom's attention, uh, where she became visibly upset, it can be repaired. It is a small moment in their relationship. Um, because the mom and the baby already had a healthy bond, that little thing does not become a big trauma for that child. But we do know that trauma can have lasting effects and not all of them are repaired early on. So what happens when home is not safe? What happens when mom, dad, whomever is the caregiver in those moments are not providing that safe, secure base? We know that early trauma exposure can compromise a child's ability to form healthy relationships. Remember, this is the first one they have. And parents may not be able to attend to their child's need and provide safety because they're dealing with their own trauma and struggling with mental illness or substance abuse. They don't necessarily feel safe either. So a study was developed in the 1990s um, and it's called the ACEs or Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And out of that study, we now know that prolonged exposure to negative events has an impact on a child development cognitively, emotionally, and physically. The study came about in California as um, a collaboration between Kaiser Permanente and the CDC, who um, through an obesity clinic found that there were so many cases of self-disclosed abuse that were coming up and affecting, they found, having a correlation or an effect on um, an adult's health, physical health. So ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, they are potentially traumatic events that occur in the childhood. There are three types of ACEs. We're talking abuse, so it's physical, emotional, or sexual neglect, physical or emotional, and then there's household dysfunction. That is, in the home, there could be a mental illness, incarcerated relative, a mother who was treated violently, a sub, sub, some substance abuse, and even divorce. Um, there is a 10-question questionnaire that comes with the ACEs study that has been replicated and used in so many different um, ways. And ACEs are common. About 60% of adults report that they had experienced at least one type of ACE. Well, look at divorce. I mean, we know that about 50% of uh, households had a divorce in it. So that's an ACE, and that's an adverse childhood experience. But then nearly one in six have reported they have experienced four or more ACEs. So let's take a look at that. There are some serious health implications that have been correlated with four or more ACEs. So if an individual has four or more ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, they have three times the life levels of lung disease and adult smoking, 14 times the number of suicide attempts, four and a half times more likely to develop depression, 11 times more likely to have an intravenous drug addiction, four times as likely to have begun intercourse by age 15, and two times the level of liver disease. So I'm going to bring back something that um, Blake said, and I wrote it down. Blake called it generational curses. They have now found that trauma is linked to disease and early death and lives in our DNA. And exposure to multiple ACEs and trauma dramatically increases the risk for seven of the 10 leading causes of death in the U.S.
it's in our DNA means that generationally it is being passed down. Traumatic events can have devastating effects. People with six or more ACEs can die 20 years earlier than those who have none. It's a pretty scary statement, but there is good news. How do we mitigate ACEs? The more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Those healthy relationships, even if it's just one healthy relationship with an adult, can help build resiliency and promote healing. Dr. Bruce Perry has devoted most of his life to studying trauma in children, and this quote is one of my favorites. Relationships are the agents of change, and the most powerful therapy is human love. So whenever I present on ACEs or I tell people about ACEs, I always feel like, oh, how are they going to respond? What are they going to, what are they going to get out of this? Um, but we have to do it because, and this is straight from the CDC, raising awareness of ACEs can help change how people think about the causes of ACEs and who could prevent them. It can shift the focus from individual responsibility to community solutions. We're no longer blaming. Let's figure out how to fix it together. It can reduce the stigma about, around seeking help with parenting challenges or for substance misuse, depression, suicidal thoughts. It can promote safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments where children live, learn, and play. So learning about ACEs, talking about trauma and the effects that it could have, I think it helps us to understand how important it is to find that stability for these families, all families. And let's help all children reach their full potential and create potential and create neighborhoods, communities, and a world in which every child can thrive. So parents really can change the world. So when a child feels that they can trust their caregiver to meet their needs, they are ready to go out in the world and learn new skills, right? That's how parents can affect, affect change. With sensitivity, being sensitive to your child, being understanding of their emotional needs, availability, having that availability um, to talk to them, to listen. I always say one of the most important things we have to do is listen. Even that serve and return, the baby was expressing, they were communicating, being available, being open, honest, open with your own feelings and modeling what that looks like. Consistency. Children love to know what's coming next. It's how they make sense of their world. Knowing that there is a structure to their world can help them to feel safe. Affection. All children, all children deserve affection from their child, I mean, from their parent. Being calm. If a parent can stay calm in those really scary moments, they are modeling calmness. They are listening. They are not reacting. And being rooted. And by that, I mean being rooted in your community, being rooted in values, being rooted in support, just having those roots holding you together. So what does it look like in parenting? Predictability. Everybody says, who wants to be predictable? Well, our kids want us to be predictable. <laughs> they really do. They like to know what's going to happen. They like to know that they're going to have dinner on the table, that there's someone's going to listen to them if there's a problem, that they feel safe. Empathy and sensitivity, that emotional regulation, modeling that listening, being sensitive to their emotions, being emotionally available. Learning that every behavior has a meaning. Our children's behavior is rooted in something. And it could be fun to figure out what it is. And it could also be very important to figure out what that is. Pairing words with actions. Be aware of the words that we use and make sure that we follow through with some positive actions. And having realistic, realistic expectations. We all want our children to succeed. We all want them to do well. But having those expectations rooted in child development helps too. Becoming child-centered and following a child's lead. This is very much a 40 carats thing for sure. Um, when, and it's important, because a child should have the opportunity to pick the book, to pick what they want to play with, to go ahead and start and initiate the play and a parent, a caregiver, an adult plays with them make that eye contact. We saw that in the serve and return video. We saw that in the still face experiment. 
that eye contact, the smiling, that is so helpful. And then having the rituals and routines at home. You know, all those fun things that we remember at, from our childhood and that we want to create for our children. That's important. Having those routines and those rituals help root us, keep us rooted when we can. Um, you know, I, we, this is based on parenting, but if you look at this list of things, it really is the basis of healthy relationship. So just keep that in mind that when we are having these conversations, when we are doing these things, when parents, caregivers are taking care of their child and providing that safety and security, you are helping them to learn what a healthy relationship is like. At 40 Carats, I just want to tell you that we are deeply rooted in all of this. We, from our superb preschool to our parenting education program and into our mental health program, our goal is to help raise, um, and, you know, these productive, fabulous adults. And we can do that by working with the family. So being able to work with the children and the family and telling parents and modeling for them and showing them that they really can have a lasting impact and together we can all change the world. Our work, um, not, I mean, I'll be a little humble, but our work is pretty fantastic and I'm proud to be there. So if you have any questions about what any of our programming is, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much, Carla. What a lovely mm -hmm. presentation. And we really appreciate having an expert here to really bring us back and reflect on some of the things that Blake said. And I feel like it just tied in so beautifully. I really learned a lot. I have a little one that just turned one. And uh, so I'm gonna use some of those tips that you provided. So thank you very much. Um, my next, the next speaker is Stephanie Battle. And Stephanie is a parent, and she also cares for her nieces and nephews. Um, she has been helping us with some of the different community projects, including the plan of safe care here in Sarasota County. And it's such a pleasure to have Stephanie here. She's going to talk a little bit about her own story, but also reflecting on herself being a parent and a parenting figure for her nieces and nephews. Um, and I know that she's going to take some of the information that Carla spoke about and sort of try to try to tie it into her own experiences. So Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, all right. Um, I became part of this initiative. I was invited through um, Operation PAR, uh, some of my background is I, um, it was a little different than most people kind of associate with the stigma of being an addict. Um, I came from a two-parent home. Stephanie, uh, I think you might be I breaking up a bit. Three siblings and my mother expected us to go to church, you know, and I always did the Stephanie? church camps and the summer, summer vacation Bible school, and we had pretty normal upbringing. Um, my father was an alcoholic. Okay. You're frozen, I think. Is, can you hear me? Is that better? Can yeah, you hear me? If, if I'm wondering if you stop your video, mm -hmm. the sound will be better. Okay. If you, if you stop your, yeah, maybe that'll help. Can you hear me any better now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. I'm doing it. Stop in video. How is it? Can you hear me more clearly now? Yes. Okay. Matter of fact. Okay. All right. That's a little bit better and less uh, distracting. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. You know, my upbringing was pretty normal. Um, not what most people would consider, you know, 
that person's coming and you know from a traumatic background and then having you know an addiction or problems um but my father was an alcoholic he was a functioning alcoholic and at a very young age i realized that you know what addiction was and i was very close to my father i loved him very much and i kind of accepted that addiction and just realized there was a person behind that addiction and um i understood as i got older that he was severely abused as a child by his father and he was trying to numb some of that pain and that trauma that he endured um but you know, my, my addiction started, I was in a really bad car accident and um, became addicted to, you know, painkillers. And long story short, I ended up at Operation Par. Um, my, at that time, I was pregnant and separated from my husband because he, you know, he had had enough of this addiction thing, years and years of it. And uh, I ended up pregnant. And my husband and I were at the point of, you know, what should we do? Are we going to, you know, have Jackson? And I made the choice to get into Operation Par. And basically my, my child saved my life. And I'm so blessed to be a parent, to have that happen. Um, so, you know, through Operation Par, I was opened up to this initiative. And um, it's been really eye-opening, especially Carlos presentation that we went through a few weeks ago. I, I've had a few weeks to reflect on how the trauma gets into the DNA of a child. And I'm seeing that firsthand with my nieces and nephews. Um, I, my 14 year old niece, um, currently, unfortunately we had to take her to the Centerstone Access Center on Saturday. Um, and she's getting the help she needs. And I'm so grateful that we've got a community that's helping. Um, but I'm really interested in kind of exploring all of these things that Carla said and, and using these tips. Um, it's really, really interesting to me how these children learn that, but you can change it, you know, by being the best parent that you can. And I'm, I'm working on trying to change these kids' lives and give them someone that they can love and just be that one person, that safe place for them. So I'm really, I'm really happy and kind of blessed to be part of this. It's it, the timing of this situation, you know, there's no, there's no coincidences. This is a, a great thing that's happening. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. Sorry, we, we had to turn your face off. I hate to do that because I feel like you're such an eloquent speaker and we would love to see your face, but it's tech, technological issues nowadays, right? Um, hopefully one day we'll be in person and this won't be an issue. Uh, we really appreciate uh, both you and Blake sharing your stories. Um, you know, I think it's just really important to reflect that everybody has their own story and their own experiences. And that's what we really are trying to, we're trying to explore with people through the SRQ Strong. You know, everyone has their own story, their own traumas, and we want to make sure that people have a safe space to really share that and, and help lift each other up. Um, I am just going to end our discussion here uh, with just some ways that people can get involved um, with the initiative. So as Giselle mentioned, our goal is to improve the coordination of services and increase access to care for pregnant women and families with young children. What we've found in our community is that we have wonderful community-based organizations and nonprofits, but it's a maze of resources and it's very difficult to navigate where to go. And so our goal is really to address these systemic barriers and make sure that families have what they need, the resources and the tools through our partners to really help these, these children reach their full potential. We have a few key components about the initiative. I'm not, going into, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. I welcome you to check out our website if you'd like to learn more information. 
but we have integrative activities. That's really my role. And we have a steering committee that is comprised of partner organizations. And we're really trying to identify how we can address some of these barriers to care. We have care coordination. Uh, we have a platform that connects medical, mental health, and social services. And this really allows us to create a seamless process in ref sending referrals throughout our community. The middle piece is parent empowerment. And I'll speak with, about that a little bit more because I think this pr really pertains to this group. Um, parent empowerment, we're trying to empower parents to not only be their child's first teacher, but also community leaders. We think it's really important to make sure that people in the community are helping us build methods that are sustainable, equitable, and really just effective. Um, another piece is partner collaboration. We are using partners, partner volunteers, partner organizations, and also parents as partners to really come up with innovative solutions. And then the last piece is targeted interventions. And that's something we're sort of starting to tap into now. Um, we're trying to develop a, a countywide plan of safe care. And this plan of safe care is to identify pregnant women who are using substances as early on in pregnancy as possible and connect them with the resources they need. So when the baby delivers, you know, maybe DCF doesn't have to be quite as heavily involved. And we know that the families have what they need. And, and Blake, um, and also Stephanie have been really heavily involved in our plan of safe care development. So I just want to give a shout out to them. It's, it's been really wonderful to have them on our team. Um, so one way that you can really get involved with the initiative is sharing information about our website. Uh, we have three different components of our website. One is just some quick facts about brain development. The next piece is families can sign up for a free text messaging service where they can learn about some easy activities and tips that they can do to boost their child's brain and also foster that child and parent relationship. And then the last piece is parents can reach out through our assistance request form. If people don't know where to start and they're having difficulty navigating that system, they can fill out this form. And then All Faiths Food, Food Bank actually responds to the referrals, does a full screening for social determinants of health and connects people with the needed resources. So we would ask if you could please share information about our website, that would be fantastic. Go check it out. If you're a parent or an aunt or a neighbor that cares for children, anyone who's interested in signing up for our text messages, we really welcome you to do so. The next piece is helping us color the community. We are starting a regional movement to encourage people to get out there and do something fun with their children through the arts. We have three different community murals. Uh, the one on the right is on the 40 Carats building, and that is called Bubbles by Truman Adams. The middle one is Swing Out Into the World, which is down in Northport. And then the last one is Making Roots. And this is going to be a traveling piece between the Sarasota County Libraries. What we're asking families to do, or anyone out in the community, is to use sidewalk chalk, go outside, and do some drawings and some creative activities, and then tag us on social media using hashtag color the community, hashtag first thousand days Sarasota. We're really trying to use that grassroots approach to spread awareness about the initiative, using our partners and using people like you in the community that want to share our work. This is just a little conclusion slide. Uh, we welcome you to also follow us on Instagram and Facebook, share the information on your page. Like I said before, please help us color the community. And then if you have any young children that you're around, we really welcome you to sign up for our text messaging service. I also am gonna put my email address in the chat. If you wanna learn more about the initiative, you wanna get involved, you wanna volunteer, we have a parent advisory committee. So if you're a parent in the community and you'd like to be a part of that or any of our ongoing community work groups, I welcome you to. Um, and that is really, it for all of us, and we would love to take some questions if any of you have any for the four of us. Yes, yeah, so so please, now's a great opportunity. Um, 
to unmute your mics and uh, give any address any questions you may have or thoughts you may have after listening to these wonderfully inspirational stories. Um, we really heard from two unbelievably strong and uh, parents and uh, brave parents who shared their stories with us. So I'm sure some of you have questions. Um, so Annalise, can we just ask questions? How do we, yes? Yeah, anyone? Anybody have any questions for any of the panelists or Chelsea? I do have a question. This is Marbeet Bunkert. And I was just wondering, so is the initiative only for Sarasota County residents or can Manatee County <laughs> residents also get involved? That's a great question. We are currently in the process of, ex of being more inclusive of our surrounding counties. Um, it's sort of a slower process to really expand our initiative efforts. So the answer is we welcome anyone in surrounding counties to be a part of it. And we're currently in the process of changing our name to First Thousand Days Suncoast. <laughs> I will put my email in the chat and please feel free to reach out. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Of course. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> um, you know, I see, I'm a guardian ad litem and I, and I see um, children being affected in homes. I'm just wondering, in high school, are they offering anything like understanding the ACEs and how it affects you? Uh, it just seems to me that we need to start at an earlier age educating people about this um, so that they have an opportunity to correct, their, correct themselves earlier in life. I'm just going to throw that out to you. Any thoughts? Carla, I, um, I see Stephanie I'm nodding sorry. her head. Yes, my my niece, my oldest one that I was speaking of, um, she is at Palmetto High right now, and I have repeatedly received calls from administrators that don't know what to do with her and her behavior. Um, they're not trained on that, and I I. I do think that it would be a wonderful thing to kind of incorporate into training of these teachers because these children have all of these backgrounds and they're coming in, you know, green dealing with these kids. They've got no idea what their background is and if they had a little bit of what Carla was talking about, I mean, you just do a brief overview and you can have a really good understanding of these kids. So I think it really should be, we should try to push this. Hmm. But my experience at Palmer, Ohio, they've got no idea what's, you know, how to deal with these kids with behavior issues that have had all these trauma things. So that's a great, great question. I will also add um, another initiative. Any that thoughts on how we can get that to happen? How does that go about getting involved, you know, incorporating that into the schools and the administrators? It was like, it, yeah, it's just, it was lagging a little bit. I was trying to see what was going on there. Um, I just wanted to add, um, you know, we are actually actively working towards creating initiative that addresses this very thing. Um, we have partnered with the Healthy Teen Coalition in kind of um, developing a train the trainers process um, through peer-to-peer -peer training and it's called the Trauma Leadership Corps. And what that is, it's a group of young adults and teenagers that are being trained on trauma-informed practices. Um, they're getting tools and skills and going through workshops to kind of develop their own um, 
training to go into the community, to go to schools or organizations or whoever really is interested in welcoming them, welcoming them in, um, to then train those teens on what they learned about trauma and kind of, you know, just hope that it spreads like wildfire. So there, we actually have 20 teens and young adults that are going through this training mm -hmm. um, and they're being trained by teens from another organization, HopeWorks, um, and they specialize in this and, and, you know, we got a grant to put this together and we're really hoping to roll it out this summer. Um, and it, it catches on. So you'll actually hear about our next monthly conversation. Actually, let me correct myself, not May, but in June, um, that trauma leadership core, those teens are going to be speaking to the community like they are like tonight um, and telling all about what they learned in the training, how they plan to use that training going forward and uh, what they hope to accomplish. So hopefully that starts to address that issue. And like I said, spread like wildfire and everyone starts to adopt these practices. So yeah, thank you for that question. That was a great question and a, a great opportunity yes. for us to, to bring up that other initiative that we're working hard on. Any other questions? Any other questions? I have one. If I, if I can ask. So this for Blake, um, okay. actually for both of you, Blake and Stephanie. So how do we get more of you? I mean, what can we as a community do to clone you, you know, to get you out there speaking to other parents who are, you know, uh, who are kind of either in the beginning phase or are walking behind you, walking in your shoes, how do we as community get more of you? I mean, to, to really to encourage and, and inspire other parents that they can they can do this. Any thoughts? Any ideas for us? Um, I, I don't know exactly what you guys have. Um, I don't know if you guys have like a hotline or um, it was kind of, it would just kind of have to be networking, you know, networking, uh, spreading the word, word of mouth. Um, you know, maybe it's some kind of system out there where there's people, it's, it's like a database, people entered into the debate, database that come across and connecting those people with the right person right. to get the right kind of help, you know, you know, you right. really, you really got to have a lot of resources and a lot of knowledge of your city, your town, um, and the people that are in it and the people that can help you really and help the person that's going through. Mm-hmm whatever they may be going through a death in the family or losing their kids or whatever the trauma may be putting the person in the right place with the right resources i think is but i don't know how it is i guess word of the mouth you know facebook um throughout the programs brochures in the right places i i really don't know that's something to I would love to help, though. So I would love to help with it. Whatever it may be, I'd love to help with it. <laughs> so, Chelsea, does the first thousand days have anything like that? I know parent empowerment is part of what you do. Have you talked about this, how you might be able to recruit more parents, more parent advocates like Blake and Stephanie? Sure. Yeah. So um, we're doing, I mean, we're doing some exploring. I think that it's really powerful to have parents with those lived experiences, helping with the building building of programmatic elements. So when we're working on this plan of safe care, we've sort of put a little bit of a hiatus right now. Um, but our goal is we want to make sure that Blake and Stephanie and other individuals who've gone through those experiences are the ones that are really building it. You know, we can be there to help support the effort, but we want to build something. Um, that people feel comfortable with. And I think it's really important to have those peers and those people with lived experience involved in the build, but also we're hiring them. I think within the community, we need to hire these individuals to really help us. Right. So are you thinking of something like that, like a development of a parent core of, of some sort uh, in a way that would be able to hire parents to go out and work with other parents? 
I think it would be great to have Stephanie and Blake, uh, you know, help us consult <laughs> and build something like this. It seems like they're both very interested and Stephanie came off mute. So I'll let her chat. And um, Stephanie, I think uh, the, the audio was a little wonky a little uh, last time. So you may have to come off of the video again to talk. I apologize. I you know, I've been yelling at my husband to get us a new router. <laughs> okay, I'm going off my wrong button. Okay, is that better? Yes. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm sorry, I've been yelling at my husband to get us a new router for about six <laughs> months now. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I really think I am so excited about this, you know, the, the peer specialist, because, um, you know, there's still a stigma around this whole addiction thing. And I'm still almost a little bit embarrassed to tell people that I was a heroin addict and, you know, my child saved my life. But they look at me and they see, see me and they're like, no way, you were really that way? And I said, yeah, I mean, I was almost dead. And um, so I think as former addicts, Blake, I, I can kind of attest that maybe it might make it, everyone feel a little bit better that we can have the courage to come out and say, hey, you can get better you know, and, and you can improve your life and you don't have to live that way. Um, but I think it's exciting to be able to do that. So I'd be definitely interested in, in getting involved because not only is it helping someone else, it's really helping me to kind of overcome that stigma because, I mean, it sticks with me every day about the things that happen during addiction, but, you know, just if you can help somebody else, it's helping yourself too. Mm-hmm. And parents helping other parents, I, I guess. And I guess, Carla, in a way, it's a question for you as well at 40 Carats, because you're so involved in this um, in terms of empowering parents. I mean, are, are you aware of any activities out in the community that are really working on empowering people like Blake and Stephanie to... Uh, be parent advocates <laughs> as a workforce. You know, it's such a great thing. And we're always looking, even within our organization, for those parents who have those stories and are willing to share them because they can be so inspirational and show the strengths. When we're out in parenting education, everything that we do is from a strength-based perspective, non-judgmental. We are talking to those families. And you would be surprised, or maybe not, at how open families are when we are with them. Um, and how much we love to see when they can support each other. So they're by telling their story and then they're hearing it from some, you know, someone else is hearing it and they connect. We know the impact that that can make. And we are always, always looking for um, those families who are willing to speak up and become advocates. Um, so I think this is great. And I would love to be a part of any organization where we can find parents to kind of keep that conversation going, keep that honesty going. I mean, Stephanie, you're right. That stigma is still out there. And the more we can punch it back and get rid of it, the better off everybody will be and the more we will join as a community to help heal. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I see there, um, there are a few questions uh, or comments. Hire community peer specialists. I think that was uh, something that, that Chelsea is, is rooting for to everybody. And that really goes for all organizations uh, to hire um, uh, peer specialist, parent peer specialist. And there was another question here about resources for teenage parents. Um, do you provide at the first thousand days resources or uh, 40 carats or any place in the community you're aware of? What resources are there out there for teenage parents? Um, I can talk about what we do. We are actually at both the SAISIS programs, the teen parent programs in Sarasota County at Riverview High School and Northport High School doing parenting education. So we are working with them weekly at, throughout the school year. We are also at TAP in Manatee, which is the teenage parent program up there, um, working with them as well weekly with parenting education. And we also do um, individual sessions, therapy sessions with some of those 
um, young parents as well. So we're doing infant mental health and we are working through their trauma with them and um, at the same time trying to promote and build that attachment with their baby. So yeah, so we're providing mental health services and parenting education to all three teen programs, mm. um, teen parent programs in our area. That, that's terrific. How do we get the word out about that <laughs> to you know, other providers and uh, mm. so that they're aware of that? We are inside of the high school every single week. So if they are a part of that program, um, they are there. Otherwise, they can come directly to 40 Carats through the mental health program or through a parenting consultation. Um, and we can help them that way. I don't know any other way to kind of spread the word, um, but we are on property at those three programs and have been um, the whole time, I think since the inception of Siesis. Right, well, that's great. I mean, Chelsea, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I was just going to add a little bit um, so there's no no confusion. So first thousand days, we don't technically really provide a service right now. It's just the convening and the use of all of our partners and our partner resources. So on our website, you know, if anyone within our region, you know, in Manatee County, Sarasota County, if people need help trying to navigate resources, they can go on and fill out an, our, our assistance request form. And that's answered by one of our partners, All Faith, All Faith Food Bank, that can, then connects them with those community resources. So they do have bilingual staff that's responding to those referrals. Um, but really what we do is just take all our partner organizations and bring everyone together, make sure that everyone knows what everyone's doing and create that seamless process for families in the community. Makes right. sense. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Okay. Are any other questions for our panelists or? I had seen, Mich it looked like Michelle Gibbs had raised her hand at one point, but I don't know if it was an accident. Giselle, I'd like to ask a question if I could. This is Alan Ross. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, from, I'll from, go oh, next. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I cut somebody off? Uh, We're fine. Okay. So it sounds like this is, the whole gist of this is that it's a self-referred kind of product. <laughs> um, Carla or Blake um, or Stephanie, anyone can respond. Is there any intervention? Is there any other pathway or do, do people have to seek out these services? Come to first 1000 days, which sounds more like a clearinghouse to direct people to the right resource. But is there, that's one direction. Right. Is there any intervention where you see something happening and, and there can, I don't know, in, in Blake, in your case, did you seek out help or did help come to you? How did, how did that play out? Um, good question. Okay, help, help didn't, okay, I guess I've had help through my, my whole life. <laughs> so, um, from like a young age of, uh, three, I was put in with therapists, um, cause I had my own trauma going on in my own life from, you know, just being in environmental situations. And, um, so I learned stuff there, but I really... I've always had counseling. I was in teen court um, growing up. I didn't want to go to high school. Um, so I was uh, skipping school. I was in seeing guidance counselors in school. Um, like I was molested, um, alcoholism, single mom, young mom who liked to drink and party. And uh, she was a great mom. Um, no, I, I mean, I had all these people in place, but it's almost like the right person wasn't communicating with me to attack the situation, if that makes sense. Um, I was talking about what I was going through, but throughout all those years of therapy and counselor and guidance counselors, and whether it be a teacher or someone in the community, it, I never had someone that got to the root core of the problem, which the core of the problem was me and not knowing how to deal with situations as, in a healthy way. So this last round, it was me getting to the core of uh, the problems and the issues and where it was uh, kind of stemmed from, where it came from, why I was acting in such a way. 
and what I could do really to change it and to change it for good instead of putting a band-aid on the situation and making a temporary fix to make the situation a lot better. Um, so what was, the, what was the catalyst in that? What was the, the, the seminal event? What, 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 if you don't mind, yeah. Saying, what happened that this, you talked about PARS or something. I didn't quite get you were referring to something earlier. Uh, Operation PAR. Yeah, Stephanie, Operation PAR. Stephanie, yes. Yeah. No, me, I was, a, I was a drug addict. It started out uh, with a pill addiction at 17 um, of just eating pain pills. And then it went into smoking pills. And then I was an IV user for about six years. Um, it was being so, I was really, a, I'm spiritual. <laughs> I was literally a, a, a human in the world living but completely dead with not wanting, I think I wasn't alive though. There was no need or want to thrive in the world. There was no, I didn't care to wake up and see the next day. It was just another day and I didn't have no one or need for that. So for me, kind of, it was kind of being so broken and I guess I'm really spiritual. <laughs> um, coming to the Lord, you know, and I had to ask for a lot of forgiveness for myself. A lot of things that I did, a lot of uh, areas there in my life to help heal me. Because I, like I said, I had a lot of therapy. Therapy wasn't healing me, you know. Um, talking to people was not doing it for me. I had to get to the root of the pain of what was going on. And I had to ask for a lot of forgiveness. And um, I, I was, I'm a reborn person. I was completely reborn. I was, I was renewed, you know. And it took a lot to get there. Mm -hmm. and how to get honest, how to be completely honest with myself about everything that I've gone through. Um, cause I would hide it and push it down kind of like, didn't want to talk about that bad stuff about me, you know? But when I got real with it about, this is really who I am. These are the things I've really gone through. And they're just, I mean, I've been homeless in the streets, you know, uh, like I said, I was a prostitute. Um, Found my dad dead, a trauma, abuse. I, I've been abused. Um, I've had abortions, uh, miscarriages. You name it, I've been through it probably. <laughs> um, so I was just getting really, really honest with myself, the issues, and finding healthy ways to recover through all that pain. I guess yeah. well, one follow-up <laughs> question. What, it's unbelievable. The courage of you women who are talking about this, that word, I'm so glad that word came up, courage. It's incredible. What allowed you to get to that point? There were so many attempts that you say did not get you there. What allowed you, what, what event allowed you to turn that corner? It sounds like something happened at some point. For me, um, okay. Alan, my father passed away. Hmm. Um, I was 29 weeks pregnant and my father dropped dead suddenly. Uh, I was still actively using heroin when I was pregnant with Jackson. And um, I had just started an operation bar. My mother and my husband put me into operation bar. That was my safety net. Um, I was so broken when my father died that um, because he was such an alcoholic and he was hurting so much. I was pregnant and I had an opportunity. You're breaking up again. Yeah. Sorry, Stephanie. To have this child and get clean and be a great parent. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, Operation Par and my father passing away was really my catalyst to, you know, get better mm -hmm. um but it's so different for everyone um but my question was to can we somehow start to 
maybe get some pamphlets or some flyers into the OBGYN's offices, um, into the Head Start offices and primary care. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, Those, was that your question? There. No, well, I don't know what to do. I turn mute off or turn my video off. <laughs> it's hard to, you're breaking up a little bit, but any of that? And I think Hold just on. if I can repeat it, Stephanie asks, is there a way we can educate primary care doctors and OBGYNs right. if they see a dangerous situation? And I think to some extent, that's also what the question Alan was asking yes. when he was, what can we do to be more proactive? I mean, Blake, you're so I, lucky. I did you're not lucky. hear... Sorry, I didn't hear there was another question. I was... It's okay. so... you, you, no, you did great, Stephanie. You answered. Oh, I no, you, you were great. I was, what was repeating yeah, what... your question for everybody because it's yeah. such a good one. Yeah. And, you know, what can we do to get OBGYN, to get primary care docs, pediatricians? They're the first, usually the first ones who you know yeah. can see a warning sign why do we have to wait till somebody is at the point that you you know Blake through your own strength and courage and whether it was faith whatever it was that made you make you know take that next step why do we have to wait so long and is there a way we can do it sooner and I think that's what Stephanie's asking I think Alan was asking so Chelsea do you have anything yes I would I would love to I would love to answer I think that Stephanie and Blake did such a fantastic job talking about their own you know personal story and and what's incredible is they were connected they got help through our community partners. So Stephanie went to Operation PAR, which is an initiative partner. You know, Blake went through the, you know, early childhood court system, which is a community partner through the Florida Center. And one thing that I'd like to mention is that SRQ Strong is a grassroots community initiative, and we're trying to identify people who have their own traumas in their life. And so using this platform right here where we're sharing stories and letting people know that they don't have to be embarrassed and there shouldn't be a stigma um, about substance use or mental illness. You know, we're really trying to use this initiative, SRQ Strong and First 1000 Days to make right. sure that there's a no wrong door approach. So First 1000 Days, we want to make sure no matter who they come in contact with, in the community, they can direct them to the right place to go. And mm -hmm. so many of our community partners, if they're seeing a, a person in the community that they know needs help, that they're able to wrap their, you know, metaphorical arms around them during this COVID time uh, and connect them with what they need. Um, and so the OBs, pediatricians, uh, First Thousand Days, the backbone organization is Sarasota Memorial um, Healthcare System. And so we have monthly meetings with the OBs and the PEDS telling them about the resources in the community. Carla is one of the chairs of an access to care work group where we're specifically focusing on mental health and connecting pregnant women and families with young children with the resources. Substance use screening goes along with that. Um, so that's, that's something that we're trying to work towards as an initiative. Uh, but I think it takes the powerful leaders like Stephanie and Blake to really move the needle on this. I think if we really want to do good work, we need people like them. You guys are eloquent speakers. You guys have been through it. You're phenomenal mothers. And I think that we really need to use you all to build. Yes. They should be speaking at your committees, if I can suggest that, to, at every meeting. I mean, their voice at the table is so important. And other organizations, I think the First Thousand Days, SRQ Strong, Here for Youth is, is another uh, organization bringing lots of different community partners and voices together. And I think um, as a relative newcomer, a few years here to Sarasota, I think we are beginning to hear so many voices at the same time echoing each other and supporting what we're saying, regardless of what system, you know, people are maybe involved in. And it's a slow process. It can be a little frustrating. It's a slow process, but I do think it's, it's happening. And I think people 
parents like Blake and Stephanie, just telling their story is so important. And I'm so glad that so many people have been here this evening, have joined us to be able to hear that. I, I, I wonder also, we have a number, I don't know if you're still on it, of uh, guardian ad litems on this call. Do you have any questions because- I do. Oh, yes. good, thank you, okay. Sharon. <laughs> yeah, hi guys, hi. I have a question. As a guardian ad litem, it's difficult to think about this in the terms that uh, basically our, our main goal, our only goal is what is in the best interest of the children. And basically the parents, once they come into court, have a year to, to be reunified with their children or the case is moved on toward adoption. So what do we do? If, if he, my, my concern is it may take years for our sobriety to occur with our families. And I know how hard it is and I know how much you're trying, but basically I've got a lot of cases with parents that are trying, but not being successful. And it's been a year and a half. So what do we do? Do we wait another few years or do we move on toward adoption with another family mm -hmm. that is clean and sober? What is in the best interest of that child who is born now and is three years old and needs a home? What, what's the best, what do you think? What do you think? It's hard, it's a hard situation for everyone. I know. Carla, do you have any, or Chelsea, you know, I'm sure you work with these situations. Yeah. It's such an individualized case by case thing. Sure, you know that. You, and I know it is. You no, know, I, I think I think when we talk about early childhood court specifically, right. and we know that reunification is that ultimate goal, that the less trauma, the less changes yes. this child experiences, the better off they are in the long run. Yes. Um, I am a big fan of trying to work that out as much as possible, exhausting possibilities until there is no more, no longer a possibility to be exhausted. Um, but I think, and Blake, you've been through the early childhood court um, system, I believe you said, yes? Not with my, oh. not with my own kids, no. Okay. Um, but I think that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard place to be in. But, you know, it I guess you would have to be, like you said, make the best choice for a child, no matter what that may be, you know. It is hard. And I like the early childhood court. I've, I've been going through it now with someone. And it's been very successful with this parent. But they're not using drugs. There was other issues involved. Mm -hmm. So it's just hard. It's a hard situation for everyone. Yes, it is. Can I it interject? Is. Mm -hmm. Who's there? I couldn't see you. Nancy Albright. I'm a guardian lion. Oh. <laughs> and I've been a yes. guardian lion for eight years, seven years. And what I find is that there are a number of biological parents that go through the system. It gets out to one year, two years. I one case is four boys for four years. They have never had the guidance of someone partnering with them. There's no one that partners with them. They go through... Uh, parenting classes, they don't know how to apply it. Is there some resource that people can come alongside and partner with them? So we're not always destroying families. Right. Well, I don't think we are always destroying families, but I don't think that at all. But, well, so I, if I could right. jump in, um, I used to work on a family intensive treatment team, which is um, a wraparound program for uh, people who have who are in dependency court uh, who specifically had their children removed because of substance abuse right. and essentially they fulfill um, we would fulfill like five or seven of the uh, case plan tasks and so we worked with parents in this very specific situation um, providing therapy and substance abuse counseling and they would get a <laughs> specialist um, so the state is starting to create programs that are there to, and, and of course we were, we would always be at court and every court, the DUI court, dependency court, we'd sit right there next to them, giving updates every month at ECC, um, all of them to make sure that, uh, mm -hmm. these parents who are really working hard, let's say they had shown so much progress and they did have a relapse, but they had made every therapy appointment, showed up to every parenting class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If it's one relapse compared to using every day, they're really trying. Maybe they deserve that extension. 
um, sure. to show that, you know, if you're, you're really working hard for your kid and this is a really hard thing, you know, if you're getting off of heroin and you're moving on to, you know, now, I, you're getting onto meth, it's really hard to, uh, it's a, just a very challenging thing to do. Yes. And uh, so, so the state is creating programs for parents so that they can be better represented in court because clearly um, just taking everybody's kids away is very expensive for the state and it doesn't benefit kids at all. Um, it's the state, very you know, traumatic. As, as it's traumatic. The and then my is. understanding yeah. is that, um, that it's better for kids to be with somewhat imperfect biological parents than to be with anybody else. Um, not saying alcoholic, terrible, mean, cruel, abusive parents. But if they're not perfect, but they are your biological parents or your uh, people who love you, you know, family, whatever, um, your children will do better. So um, at least that was my understanding of this yeah. research and that created the program. Um, and I so, think what, yeah. what, if I can okay. interject, I think what Julia is talking about, the FIT program, it's a terrible name, but sure. I, oh. uh, <laughs> and with Nancy Ray's and, and Sharon, I mean, I think we we need more tools. You need more tools because you have to keep children safe. I mean, we need more tools to keep families together, to keep children safe, um, and and to really help them thrive. And we're getting there. There are programs. Um, we need more resources. But we're just about running out of time. And I have to say, uh, if I can, to just thank everybody. Thank I have to you. thank our speakers for their their stories and your courage and your inspiration. And I would be remiss if I don't give a quick coming attraction um, that for next month on May 24th um, for our community forum, and um, Annalise put it up, it's Community Partnership Schools. It's a trauma-formed approach. And if you <laughs> really want to hear a, a dynamic group talk about our education system, uh, some of the challenges that the education system faces and a new model um, for really uh, in terms of education and bringing all of the different resources together in schools. Um, it's really going to be a, a fascinating program. I think you'll learn a lot. So please tune in. And also um, to know that from May 5th to May 26th, we're doing an anti-race, raising anti-racist children parenting workshop. And that's being sponsored by SR2 Strong. Um, of course, it's free. Everything we do is, is free. And it's really an excellent workshop. Um, I encourage any of you to please uh, suggest it to uh, members of your community and your constituencies who would be interested um, and to go online and, and they can sign up. I believe we still have spots open in the workshops, right, Annalise? Yes, registration is still open. Um, you can find it in the same place how you registered tonight on our Eventbrite page. You can register for this workshop as well as the May workshop. And I'll give you a little teaser that in June, how I said, if you wanted to hear more about the Trauma Leadership Corps, that's coming up in June as well. And that's, that's coming up in June. Right. So we have a lot of exciting programs, a lot of informative and, and inspirational programs like you heard tonight. <laughs> Um, eventually, you know, we'll be able to get back to meeting in person. We hope, you know, we started out by having these conversations in person. And then uh, after COVID, <laughs> we went to an online platform in a few months. Who knows? Uh, we might be able to get back together again. So um, am I okay to say goodbye, Annalise? She's the producer. Yes. So yes, absolutely. thank you all for joining us. Um, again, our speakers and all of you in the audience and for your questions. You were a great group and thank you for a terrific conversation and hope to see you thank next you. month. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Bye. Now. Bye. Bye. Bye.